Nintendo Switch is the most powerful dedicated gaming handheld to date, but with a steep mountain to climb. It's a hybrid device battling on three fronts. Firstly, as a successor to its ill-fated Wii U home console. Secondly, as a pricier, almost high-tech sibling to its portable 3DS. And finally, as Nintendo's first, perhaps understated attempt at a standalone tablet. Regardless of which one you use, it's just one device at the center to carry all experiences. But the question is, does it hit the mark on all three targets? Hello, it's Tom here with a review of the Nintendo Switch. There's a lot to cover, but today I'll be looking at how the quality of the Switch hardware and accessories hold up, and the screen itself for gaming. I'll also be tackling the rumors of the connectivity issues with the Joy-Con controllers, looking at the menu options, heat levels, and acoustics, plus battery tests right at the end. All right, with that said, let's get going. Let's look at the hardware first. The Switch's main party trick is that ability to transform from a home console to a fully portable handheld. At the heart of this is a sleek and adaptable tablet, in every way a leap in quality over its predecessor, the Wii U gamepad. The fundamental change is that all graphics processing is handled natively on the unit, whether docked under your TV or out in the wild. The fact Switch is a self-contained powerhouse handheld makes it feel more like a successor to the 3DS in this respect. And despite all the technology being packed into it, it still feels comfortable in the hand, weighing just 297 grams in tablet mode. Physically, every part of the Switch tablet is a step up from Wii U. The screen size stays at 6.2 inches, but moves from the gamepad's 480p TN panel to a higher quality 720p IPS panel, now with capacitive touchscreen. Crucially, the bezel is much narrower, barely a centimeter in all directions, and the device is just over a centimeter in depth. All of which is to say it's thinner and simply more effective as a portable device than the Wii U's cumbersome design. Starting at the top left, you have a recessed power button, a volume rocker, and a long air vent at its center that reveals a small bin array inside. You also get a 3.5mm headphone jack and finally a tiny slot for game cuts at the far end. At the bottom is just a single USB-C port. This is an all-in-one input and you can of course use it to charge directly with a supplied AC adapter. One curious omission here is some sort of LED. At least some indication of power status or Wi-Fi activity would have been useful like we have on 3DS. Last but not least, there's a micro SD card slot sneakily hidden underneath the kickstand. That supports up to the UH speed class one cards for up to 104 megabytes per second throughput. However, the stand is one area I'm not keen on. The hinge has more flex to it than you'd expect. It doesn't instill confidence when snapping it out fully, and it's a far cry from the firmness of the Microsoft Surface Stand, for example. It's certainly functional, but the build quality here is at odds with the rest of the device. As for the specs, much has been said of the move to Nvidia's Tegra technology here already. There's strong evidence it uses an updated Maxwell-based Tegra X1 chip with the same die size and similar power profile as Shield TV's 2017 revision. It features four ARM Cortex A57 cores, 256 CUDA cores, and 4GB of RAM. As a home console, it's a big departure from the IBM PowerPC architecture Nintendo's used from the GameCube up until the Wii U. It's a fresh start, but an exciting one. And crucially, this technical break gives Nintendo the ability to condense everything it needs into one small handheld. My own previous testing also shows this chipset is capable of some serious legacy coverage. Even unofficial emulators on a Shield TV, which uses the first revision of the X1, shows GameCube and Wii games working to a playable level. With Nintendo at the helm to convert these games properly, there's a big potential to not just get great looking new games running on Switch, but also its older titles. So in practice, how do games hold up on the Switch's 6.2 inch screen? Initial impressions are glowing and you can expect the best quality LCD panel Nintendo has ever produced in a handheld so far. The IPS panel oozes quality, giving a vibrant clear image that fits the console's high launch price. Contrast levels are excellent out of the box, a league away from the dull low contrast TN panel used on the Wii U. And color accuracy also carries its content well, featuring only a very light blue push when compared to a calibrated MacBook Pro IPS panel. For a Nintendo handheld, this sets a new high watermark. Even in motion, pixel response times are surprisingly strong and certainly better than the 3DS XL I own. Simply put, there's no obvious trace of ghosting on gray to gray transitions. Four dull colors on the lowest brightness setting, smearing and trails behind objects are invisible. 
The pros and cons of IPS technology are still in line with recent iPhone models or the Vita Slim. So for example, black levels are decent in brightly lit rooms, but certainly pale in comparison to OLED devices when viewed in the dark. There's also an obvious gamma and color shift when tilting the device around. For outdoors use, the Switch is again very usable. For reference, the screen hits a higher brightness level than either the 3DS XL or the Wii U gamepad on their peak settings. But as a general turnout, overall it's very comfortable and the Switch ramps its brightness up high enough to use effectively in broad daylight. The decision to give Switch a 1280x720 panel is also on point for a handheld, balancing nicely with the capabilities of its internals and not to mention battery life. The end result is still Nintendo's most sophisticated handheld to date, but for better or worse, the tablet on its own looks much like any other smart device on the market. Thankfully, the Joy-Cons give the Switch some much needed character. Using the rails at either side of the tablet, these slide down smoothly to a satisfying echoing click. I can confirm the metal rail attachment is robust from our test so far, with five screws fixing the bracket to the tablet's edges. It's a reassuringly sturdy connection once clicked in, and only unlocked by the two small buttons at the back. Really, the two Joy-Cons are the stars of the show. Wireless, motion controlled with a tight vibration for feedback, built-in shoulder buttons, and even an IR remote on the right-hand remote. The 525 milliamp hour battery in each has a long lifespan too, rated by Nintendo at around 20 hours a piece. And at last, on a gaming handheld, we have proper raised clickable thumbsticks this time. The only downside? We can't overlook that neither offers a real D-pad. For the sake of symmetry, each Joy-Con instead uses individual direction buttons that I can see being an issue for fighting games down the line. Overall, the Joy-Cons are at their most comfortable when plugged into the tablet or connected to the individual grips included in the box. But also supplied is a unified controller grip, combining both Joy-Cons into one wireless pad. This sounds ideal on paper, but the results may not be to all tastes. I found it functional but uncomfortable for long play sessions. The controller grip doesn't give quite enough space for your fingers at the back, leaving your hands in an odd clawed position. For a full-fledged traditional gaming controller, the Switch's Pro Pad really is the way to go. I've got one right here, and sadly, it is an extra £65, but you do get a proper D-pad this time, a larger battery rated for 40 hours, the analog sticks are larger and more accurate, and it sits neatly in the palms. This is the real deal, if you're planning on using the Switch as a docked home console and if you can take the extra price, the Pro Pad comes highly recommended, especially if you plan on playing games like Ultra Street Fighter 2. The last part of the package is of course the Switch dock. It's an innocuous hard plastic block that interfaces with the USB-C port at the bottom of the tablet Nothing is included in the dock in terms of processing power here, it simply gives the tablet access to full mains power to untap higher clocks on the Switch's GPU and memory. Docking also gives you access to three USB ports, two on the side, one in the center, and of course a HDMI out to send the image to your TV. All the wiring is hidden at the back, meaning it's quick and easy to just guide the tablet down and go from there. But as a side note, you must use the dock to connect the switch to a TV. A common USB-C to HDMI converter won't do anything. One criticism here is the lock-in procedure. You get two metal pins at the bottom to help guide the tablet's USB-C down to the middle. It feels slightly inelegant though, and there's a lack of insulation between the screen and the dock as you slide it down. All you have are two strips of hard plastic that run against the screen with a small patch of felt near the bottom. I will say scratches haven't appeared on our unit so far, but for such an expensive device, more padding would have been reassuring. There is one last issue to mention on hardware, and that's the quality of connection between the Joy-Cons and the tablet. Reports before the Switch's launch suggest this wireless signal can be disrupted, and I wonder just how serious this is in practice. Well, I can confirm there is merit to some of this, at least when playing in a larger room space. Now, not everyone will be affected, and this is influenced by a mixture of room dimensions, your distance to the switch, and also whether it's docked. But laying a tape measure out across the room, I did notice sync issues in repeatable conditions. So to experiment, I tried each Joy-Con at varying distances, using the console's calibration menu to spin each stick around to catch any signal hiccups. I had no issue at all in a smaller bedroom, or playing nearby in portable mode and in fact both Joy-Cons work perfectly from well over 8 meters away in the living room. It's fine, even with people walking in front, so long as they're pointed directly towards the screen. However, there is an issue if either is too heavily obstructed, especially with the left side controller. Each Joy-Con loses signal once covered completely with your hands or put behind your back. 
Even at two meters, the left Joy-Con connection starts to break up when held behind your back, leaving a choppier circular moment on the calibration screen. By comparison, the right Joy-Con doesn't show these symptoms to the same extent, but they are there. The breakup in signal kicks in only slightly at five meters in that case, and again only with the controller held behind your back. Even swapping hands to account for a difference in angle, it's fair to say the left Joy-Con has bigger issues when obstructed. So overall, both do have signal cuts when pushed, and the left one is more prone to it. But is it really an issue? Well, for the most part, no, but this is just something to be aware of. The signal strength is generally resilient, but not as strong as a regular gamepad. Being held in small enclosed spaces or pressed against something obstructing its path does it no favors. If you're aware of this before going in, it's easy to avoid. But the fact there is a difference at all between the two Joy-Cons here is curious. Booting the Switch to its main menu, this is Nintendo's most straightforward system UI to date. The grid layout is gone from the Wii U, at least for launch, and instead you get a long row of tiles that you can swipe along with your finger. It's low on clutter and dedicated buttons for news, eShop, album, controller options, general settings and power are at the bottom. And it's here that you realize you can take screenshots at any time with a tap of the square button on the left Joy-Con, which sends a JPEG straight to the album. This actually flags a surprising design choice from Nintendo. The Switch outputs at a maximum of 1080p with options for 720p and 480p in there too. But here's the catch. Even while docked to a TV, all the menus you see here will be rendered at 720p regardless. When connected to a screen, all the graphics, text, and even the Mii Maker app upscale from 720p to whatever resolution you have set as your output. That's really quite a shame. For the sake of keeping things simple, Switch's front end seems to keep the native 720p layout used in portable mode, all of which means a less clear image on 1080p or 4K sets. Delving into the settings, there's a few useful extras here. For those who need it, Switch does support USB LAN adapters, giving a wide internet connection while docked, as well as regular Wi-Fi. You have Amiibo support too, with NFC connectivity built into the right Joy-Con, just by holding your Amiibo over the analog stick, plus support for the Bluetooth 4.1 standard. Beyond that, it's all about what you install to it. With 32GB of pre-installed NAND flash memory, out of which only 25.9GB are usable, you will need to ration your space carefully with digital purchases. For small indie games, this shouldn't be an issue, but it's easy to see major releases chewing through this quickly. For example, digital games confirmed so far include Puyo Puyo Tetris at only 1GB. More trying is the 7GB requirement for games like Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, and up to 32GB for Dragon Quest Heroes 1 and 2. That far exceeds the Switch's default space, and unfortunately, external USB HDDs aren't supported with the console, even while docked. MicroSD cards are the best workaround, and another must for using the Switch in the long term. So last up, let's talk power, noise, and thermals, all parts that are interlinked in the balancing of gaming hardware performance. The Switch packs in plenty of horsepower, featuring those four ARM Cortex-A57 cores, where strong evidence points to a revised NVIDIA Tegra X1. However, clock speeds are adjusted based on whether the console is docked or in portable mode. The good news, regardless of mode, the Switch doesn't ramp up fan noise to distracting levels, even in top-end 3D games with your volume muted. And at room temperature, evidence does suggest there's no problem with Nintendo's management of heat or acoustics in the Switch tablet. I put this to the test with a thermal camera. The hottest point is expectedly at the air vent at the top, where leaving the Switch idling at the menu puts it at 30 degrees Celsius, whether docked or undocked. That creeps up massively during intensive 3D games in docked mode, and after 20 minutes that same spot goes to 52 degrees maximum. Meanwhile, in portable mode, the power throughput is reduced massively, meaning we see thermals peak at 10 degrees lower, at 42 degrees Celsius. All in all, it's a comfortable level of heat in the hand, at worst giving you a lukewarm touch on the back of the unit. Now, battery life is a more pressing issue. For perspective, while docked, the Switch demands 7.5 watts on the main menu and 16 watts at peak during games. That's docked, but even with its reduced GPU clocks in portable mode, keeping a lid on power consumption does pose a challenge, and a built-in 4310 mAh battery has to service it for at least 2-3 to three hours. I put this to the test to see exactly how much juice this gives it during a long continuous play in visually intensive games. The result? Expect just over 3 hours of use while playing intensive titles on either low or 50% brightness, with volume set halfway and Wi-Fi enabled. 
Incidentally, this is the same time it takes for the console to perform a full recharge. It's not an impressive number on the whole, and at maximum brightness it gets worse still, at 2 hours and 37 minutes. Nintendo claims battery life can stretch to 6 hours given less taxing software, but it sets the bar for what to expect in major 3D games. To solve this, we have the option of plugging external power banks into the Switch's USB-C port, giving it extra juice on the go. These are the same you'd use for a regular mobile phone, and a large GMYLE branded battery only costs around £15. The one we're testing here is rated at 10,000 mAh, but in all honesty these are cheap cells and it's not as effective as it sounds. At max brightness, it takes only 4 hours and 13 minutes to wear through the external battery, before the switch defers to its own solution. In total, that combines to 6 hours and 50 minutes, a decent overall time, but for the extra weight and wiring involved, we'd hope for so much more. Overall, in many ways, Nintendo Switch is what the Wii U should have been. It's a better built machine, sporting high grade materials, an innovative Joy Con controller setup, and a gorgeous screen. The company's strength in handheld design is clearly tapped into, and while it may be pushed as a home console first, it's more exciting to see it as a kind of successor to the 3DS. Switch rightly takes the crown as the most powerful dedicated gaming handheld right now, but the bonus is its effective and seamless home console mode. Certain limitations are clear though. As a hybrid console, it has drawbacks on both sides of the package. In a portable state, the battery struggles to hold for over 3 hours in taxing titles, something even a sizable 4310mAh battery can't avoid. Meanwhile, for the docked home console experience, the known technical specifications do fall short of the competition from PS4 and Xbox One. Don't expect top-of-the-line third-party games to reach Switch, and if they do, expect a degree of compromise in visual quality or performance. There is no denying this is still a compelling piece of technology. Putting aside the controller sync issues and an unconvincing stand, there's a lot to celebrate actually. The Joy-Cons adapt brilliantly to any situation, and the tablet is ruggedly built in most other regards, with a smart finish delivering games at a quality beyond anything we've seen on a handheld. It is a cliche, but the value of any hardware rests on great software, and it's Nintendo that will be the one to watch going forward. Of course, then there's the issue of price. At a launch cost of £280 or $300, it is a big ask. For me, the game lineup is too light on the ground to justify it as an impulse buy. It's also worth considering the extras you'll need to get the most from it. A larger SD card is essential, the Pro Controller is recommended for home use, and an external power bank is worthwhile on the go. For now, what we have is a strong foundation to build on. It's pricey and not without fault, but I can't wait to see where Nintendo takes it. Anyway, that's enough from me. If you did find this review useful or insightful in any way, please do give us a like or subscribe below. But until next time, thanks for watching.